Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me. Box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and call us 208-991-4783. Well, I do want to let you know, if you have a Kindle... My new ebook is out, What Made the Golden Age Shine. In it, I take a look at what made the golden age of radio, television, and motion pictures so special and made the film so, and the uh, overall products of that area so watchable even today. It's a great uh, tribute and uh, commentary on the strength of the golden age of Hollywood. It's available for $2.99 for the Kindle. And you can also get it, uh, borrow it for free through the Kindle Lending Library. And we still have available All I Needed to Know, I Learned for Columbo. That also available for the iPad and the Nook. And uh, in the superhero comedy series, we also have uh, Rise of the Robo Lawyers out with a brief reference to uh, a famous 1950s and 60s TV lawyer show. And that's just uh, for the Kindle. All right, well, now it's time to get into today's episode of Sherlock Holmes. From April 11, 1949, here's the Mad Miners of Cardiff. <laughs> From New York City, the makers of Clipper Craft Clothes for Men and more than 1,200 leading retail stores from coast to coast present Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's immortal character, the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes, starring John Stanley. <laughs> this week's story, The Mad Miners of Cardiff. Hear that, Holmes? That, that crumbling noise? Yes, Watson. Well, this coal mine we're in may be collapsing, and we better hurry back to the lift. Without discovering what awful thing has been driving the miners insane? Not a bit of it. Yes, but listen. If we stay, if we don't try to find the lift and return to the Earth's surface, there'll be just one consequence, Holmes. We'll, we'll be buried alive. <laughs> When you step out proudly in the Easter parade, dressed in your smart new Clippercraft suit, no one will believe that you paid only $45 for it. But that's right, because now $45 is all you have to pay for a nationally famous Clippercraft suit of carefully selected tested worsted, of exceptionally fine tailoring, with a distinctive styling that sets Clippercraft suits apart from any suits ordinary, ordinarily sold at anywhere near this price. Now, here's how this is accomplished. More than 1,200 independent merchants get together and pool their tremendous buying power. That makes these low prices possible for Clippercraft. So compare Clippercraft clothes with clothes selling for many dollars more, and you'll agree that never before has there been such value in fabrics, such value in styling, such value in workmanship. In short, you get America's greatest clothing value when you buy Clippercraft clothes. Dr. Watson, your memoir for this evening is entitled The Mad Miners of Cardiff. Cardiff is a city in Wales, isn't it? Yes, it is, Mr. Harris. The very heart of one of the world's greatest coal mining centers. Our story begins one awful night at the mine owned by Mrs. Anne Powers. There were two lifts at the mine. Huge iron cages operated by a chain winch that lured the men down the shaft and into the winding, treacherous black tunnels below. One lift was rarely in use, since it dropped into a portion of the mine that was abandoned. It was there that the horror began to unfold. There stood Daniel Lowara, a veteran miner, covered with grime, his lamp still flickering in his hat, leaning on his pick and shovel. He had paused for a moment's rest on his way home this night. When, 
when he heard a sound. Strange, he thought. No one had used this lift in some time. This section of the mine had been picked clean and deserted. It's too dangerous, you see. Daniel walked slowly toward the mouth of the shaft. Lud, it's you. What are you doing in this section of the mine? It's God's justice, that's what. We are paying for it, we are. We had no right. We had no right to put off the cage, man. I've never seen you look like that. I do. Can't you stand up? Here, I'll help you. I don't know. Your eyes. I've never seen a man's eyes like that. It's what I've seen. The saints preserve me. It's what I've seen. Get hold of yourself, lad. A strong man like you, quivering. What did you see? The thing. That's all you could call it. Down in the mine. I wish my eyes had been struck from my head before I saw it. Try to make sense, lad. What's down the mine? What have you seen? I've seen men's bodies crushed by the weight of coal. I've seen men dying of the lung sickness with a death rattle in their throats. But never this. We never did. Tell me what happened. If I told you what I saw, you'd be going out of your mind. It isn't right for human beings to know there is such a thing inside the earth. They'd kill themselves. I... I heard a noise at this end of the mine. Go on. I knew it was deserted. Of course it is. Every beam is chalk marked unsafe. How could you? I heard a noise. It was not a noise of this world. Eh? My canary was all right, alive and well, singing in its cage. And I knew there was no danger of gas. And then I saw it. You can't imagine what it is. It's Mother Nature striking back, that's what. It's the Earth's revenge. She's spewing up the secrets we never knew she held. And I've seen it. I've seen it. Lad, lad, you know, I can do that to a man. Help! Someone! Not having a strange fit. Hurry! Call the doctor! Call the doctor! Lud, the miner, in a half-crazed state, was removed to the hospital. Then Daniel volunteered to descend the lift at the far end of the mine to learn what the unspeakable horror was below. When Daniel came up the lift... Lud was right. Better I'd have been blind. A man's mind can't stand such a sight. In the name of mercy, make me unconscious. I mustn't think of it. But, but I couldn't think of anything else again, ever. Not of life, nor of what we do in life. Just this... What is all I've ever known or know? Just what I've seen down in the mine. Beg your pardon, Mrs. Powis. Yes, Jeffrey. I'm just one of your miners, Mrs. Powis. I've no right here in your house. Oh, you're but... welcome, Jeffrey. I've told the men I keep the same rules my husband did before he died. My employees are always welcome. What can I do for you? It's about this terrible thing in the mine. I know none of the men will work. I know you've tried everything. I know even the police won't go down to see what this devil of a thing is. I won't accept any more volunteers, Geoffrey. Oh, it isn't that, ma'am. It's... Well, I know you've troubles. The mine isn't worth a shilling now. I... I've some savings, ma'am. Thank you. But I won't hear of it. I refuse to borrow, least of all from my own men. You've suffered, too, with the mine closed. Oh, I knew a fine lady wouldn't borrow. I thought I'd buy the mine, ma'am. But it isn't worth anything now. I haven't much to offer. Precious little. But I might salvage the equipment, sell the land. I know you're desperate, ma'am. I wouldn't embarrass you. But you need a rest. You could at least go away. I was fond of your late husband. I want to help his widow. We men are fond of her, too. I appreciate it, Geoffrey. But I shall try to keep the mine a bit longer. I must face it. This indescribable thing in the mine must be unmasked. But how? You won't Since allow... Since no one will descend the shaft and look at the sight. I've one last hope, Geoffrey. He's an expert on the curious, the outlandish, on mysteries of this sort. He's in London. A Mr. Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Mrs. 
Why, as you say, two men became half crazed looking at the spectacle in the mines? Yes, Mr. Holmes. Incredible. Can such things exist? Blood and Daniel have been miners all their lives, Mr. Holmes. They're normally vigorous, healthy, and cool-headed. But I wasn't satisfied with their reactions. What did you do? I asked the mine doctor to go down the shaft and look. And did he? Yes, he did. And he came back up in the cage in a waxy, immobile state, without human response, as though alive and yet dead. I see. Has he revived since? Yes, the moment he was alone, he attempted suicide. We stopped him, fortunately. Hmm. In what condition are Ludd and Daniel? Well, Ludd has left. He's gone to Edinburgh, where he's resting, at the Hotel Cosmopolitan. He refuses to tell a soul what he's seen. Daniel is at home, feverish, fitful. Hmm. Have you completed your story, Mrs. Pies? Yes, I have. Then we must lose no time in reaching Cardiff and the enigma that lies in the mine. <laughs> This is the lift that descends to the abandoned portion of the mine, Mrs. Pies? Yes, Mr. Holmes. At the bottom of this shaft lies the thing that has driven three men mad. Mrs. Powis! Mrs. Powis! Yes, Geoffrey? Daniel. He rose from his bed. They couldn't stop him. He's vanished. Uh, suppose you tell me the details. I've assumed command on this problem. I'm Sherlock Holmes. This is my colleague, Dr. Watson. Uh, Daniel's gone, Mr. Holmes. The town's... Well, the town's in a state of alarm. Some folks say the evil at the bottom of the mine spirited him away. Some of the women are offered taking the children and fleeing to the hills. What should we do, Mr. Holmes? The answer is simple, Mrs. Pyles. Well, Joe Holmes, have you the solution? The path to the solution, Watson. Well, what is it? By the path before us, to that lift. You're, you're going down to, to see the thing? Exactly. There must be some other way, Mr. Holmes. You know what's happened to everyone who's seen it. You'll come up out of that shaft like the others, and you're my last hope. You'll be carried off that lift as though you'd seen Judgment Day. That remains to be seen. Oh, you can't, sir. You mustn't risk your life, your sanity this way. If you'll step aside, Jeffrey. Uh, you'll not do this alone, Holmes. I shall see this through by your side. This is not a calculated risk, Watson. This is an inconceivable horror beyond human calculation. Whatever it is, Holmes, I shall go with you. Mr. Holmes, please. I'd rather lose the mine. The town itself is already alarmed, Mrs. Powers. We must face this. I shall wait here, Mr. Holmes. And pray for you and Dr. Watson. Give them headlamps, Geoffrey, and a canary. Certainly, ma'am. They're here by the shaft, the lamps. Just put these hats on. Mr. Holmes, so. Thank you. Dr. Watson. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the canary is in this cage. I'll take the cover off. As long as the canary seems well, you need not fear a gas leak. If the canary seems ill, if it dies... It'll warn you that poison gas is in the air. Yes, quite. The gate, Watson. Close it. Yes, right. Now, we shall look upon this thing below, whatever it is. Even if it's from the realm of another world, some monstrosity beyond man's limited imagination. Release lever, Watson. Release lever. We're going down. The mark, Holmes. Ten feet. The mark. Twenty feet. The mark. Thirty feet. Here's the way to get the most for your money when you buy a new spring outfit. Look for the Clippercraft label. Be sure of the Clippercraft label. You'll find it on new spring Clippercraft worsted suits for only $45, on all wool covert cloth topcoats for $40, and on the Clippercraft all wool gabardine topcoats for only $42.50. Clippercraft clothes take the name from the famous Clipper ships that established honest New England quality everywhere in the world. Yet they're as modern as the Clipper planes that fly around the world today. Yes, you can trust Clipper Craft clothes and the men who sell them. That's why men who know insist on Clipper Craft clothes bearing the Clipper Craft label. So be sure to visit the Clipper Craft store in your city. These leading stores in the metropolitan area are proud to add their names to Clipper Craft in your suits and top coats. In Manhattan, Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th, John Wanamaker's Men's Stores, Broadway at 8th, 
and 67 Liberty Street, in Brooklyn, Abram & Strauss, in Newark, New Jersey, Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge Newark, and in Jamaica, the B&B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue. Dr. Watson, Dr. Watson, we left you and Mr. Holmes dropping deep into the abandoned mine on the outskirts of Cardiff. Yes, so you did, Mr. Harris. Holmes and I stood in the cage, bracing ourselves as we dropped down the black, musty shaft, prepared for what promised to be an intolerably awful sight. You've almost reached bottom, Watson. Ready? Yes. Ready, Holmes. Yeah, we're slowing down. Must be the bottom. Yes, here it comes. Now, step off the lift. Keep an ear open for strange sounds. This is an abandoned area. A seam may crack and we'd be buried alive. Where do we go, Holmes? Along this narrow tunnel? Precisely. The light in our headlamps isn't very good, but it must suffice. All right, go on, Holmes. Hello? What is it? What, what is it, Holmes? Just a head. A very strange object. What does it look like? It's against a beam. Turn your head, Watson, so the lamp in your hat lights the passage to the left. See? Yes. yes. Have a closer look. Just move along. <coughs> Foul air. <coughs> the canary all right? Shh. We'll see. Wait. This is all right. No poison gas in the air yet. Good. Here we are. That object. Why, it's, it's a human body. A dead man. From the description Mrs. Powers gave, I should say this is Daniel, the second miner to have witnessed the vision. The man Jeffrey said disappeared a while ago. See his throat? Brutally strangled. But who could have done it, Holmes? How did this happen? You hear that? There's a crumbling noise. Yes. It might be a cave in. Hadn't we better hurry back to the lift? No, wait. Listen. Well, come, Holmes. We, we must try to reach the lift and go to the surface. This mine may be collapsing here. No, Watson, it isn't the mine. Then what is it? The thing? It was the other lift. Someone's approaching. Someone's approaching? Exactly, from the far end of this tunnel. I've been waiting for those footsteps. Is this thing on human feet? Why have you been waiting for footsteps? I've been waiting for the person you'll see standing before us in the passageway. It will be Jeffrey. Uh, the, the miner? Quite. You've found Daniel's body. I thought you would... How did you get down here? Via the other lift, Watson, at the working end of the mine, the one he's been using all along. Well, Geoffrey, I imagine you'll present the same offer to us that you made to Ludd and the Doctor and Daniel. Offer, Holmes? Well, you see, my dear Watson, there isn't anything in this abandoned mine. The ghastly sight, so-called, is a device, rather adroitly employed by Geoffrey. My offer is very inviting, Mr. Holmes. You see, when I was down here just before this part of the mine was deserted, I located a new vein of coal, a rich vein, a vein that could make me and all who helped me Millionaires. Yes, so you decided to frighten everyone away, lest they discover it. At least to keep them away until you owned the mine. I promised a share of the new vein to Ludd. He gave a fine performance, I thought. So did the doctor. I made an arrangement with him, too. Not so splendid a performance, Geoffrey. He must have injected himself with drugs to appear waxy and immobile. The story has worked well. It keeps the miners away. It makes the mine worthless. Giving you the opportunity to purchase it from Mrs. Powers for a trivial sum. She refused me, but she'll accept. Everyone comes round to my way of thinking. Obviously, Daniel didn't. Evidently, he chose to return here for another secret rendezvous with you to demand a larger share. So you did away with him. About my offer. We'll make no agreements with murderers, sir. My terms are that you will return to the surface. You will be as convincing a pair of actors as the others. You will rant and rave about what you've seen. You will, of course, say nothing of Daniel. You will collapse, seemingly hysterical. A few days in bed, then you recover. Uh, that is one of the most desperate... My terms are that you will swear like the others, never to describe what you have seen as long as you live. It is supposedly too hideous to repeat. In exchange for all this, 10% of the new vein. And if we reject the offer? Oh, I'm afraid there isn't much choice, Mr. Holmes. Listen. But... What is that hissing sound? I tapped the spot where I knew a very small amount of coal gas would escape, Dr. Watson. It's filtering now into this tunnel. I, I, I don't believe it. You're just trying to intimidate us. Am I? Watch your canary, Doctor. Just watch. Watch. The, the canary is dead. Then extinguish your headlamp, Watson, instantly. Yes, right. I shall, too. And you, Jeffrey... Or will you risk creating an explosion? I'll turn out my lamp. 
But as for an explosion, I suppose you believe me now. I have a box of matches, gentlemen. If I strike one, just one, it'll explode the gas. We will be blown to bits. And we are to accept your offer or you'll strike the match? Oh, yes. If you return to the Earth's surface and reveal this, my life isn't worth living. I'd rather we all died here. And now, the gas will overcome us at any moment with very little time. Here's the matchbox and the match. I'm ready to strike it. Do you accept my offer? Yes or no? No. You're sure you won't reconsider? We will not reconsider. I'll stand by that. Just one second more and I strike the match. Watson, I've got it. It's pitch black, but I... Got his arms, Watson. The rope at his belt. Can you find it? Yes. Right, right you are. Hold him, hold him still now. It's so blasted dark here. Let's go. Tie him I've up. got him, Holmes. Tie him up. Let me go. I've got a simple jujitsu that'll keep him still now. Let go. I can just find his wrist. There. And now the knot. I can't move. Don't knot. leave me here. The gas. No, we shan't leave you, Jeffrey. We shall take you to the surface and turn you over to the police. Come on, Watson, along the passageway where we came. You find it with your hands? Yes, 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 I have it, Holmes. Then go back. Now, after you, Geoffrey. There's a small beam of light ahead. It, it must be the shaft. That's it. That's the cage to the surface. Yes, so it is. See, there's the lift. All right, jump on, Watson. You too, Geoffrey. <coughs> I'll get on. There, there we are. Uh, it's as I feared, I guess. She always wins. She? The Earth. She's cursed, that's what. Her blessings aren't blessings at all. They carry a curse. The gold, the oil, the coal, the diamonds, all the riches of the soil. When we defile the soil and cut too deep, when we slash into our forests and slice the heart out of our mountains, she demands vengeance. And she exacts her toll. That is a lesson you should have learned earlier in the game, Geoffrey. <laughs> Lever Watson. Yes, right, Holmes. They called your friends the mad miners of Cardiff, Geoffrey. And in a sense, they were really mad. The cruel dream of power and wealth and glory, illicitly won. A dream not native to Cardiff, nor to these times. Well, no, by George Holmes, I... Ever thought we'd see the flat here at Baker Street again, eh? Hmm. Lack of confidence in my ability, Watson. Therefore, totally unjustified. How did you know, Holmes, about there being no terrible sight at all in the mine? Well, you see, the miner, Ludd, departed suddenly for Edinburgh and the Cosmopolitan Hotel, a very expensive hotel. Curious that a miner should do that, unless he'd suddenly receive money. Mrs. Powers said Ludd was a miner all his life. Would he spend his little savings on a lavish excursion? No, of course not. Oh. How did you know it would be Geoffrey in the mud? Well, if you recall when Geoffrey ran up to us with Mrs. Powers at the lift... Yes, I do. Well, I observed a chalk mark on the back of his jacket. It was a portion of the symbols employed upon the beams in a mine. The chalk had come off a beam and soiled the jacket, though Geoffrey didn't notice. Although no one was supposed to be in the mine recently... Geoffrey had clearly returned from a visit paid just a few minutes before. Oh, I see. Tell me, Holmes, about a sight that... Well, about some mysterious, unheard-of thing that would be so utterly awful it would drive the spectator instantly out of his mind. Are such things possible? <laughs> Is there any reason to believe they are not, Watson? Couldn't there be such a thing lurking... Looking around the next turn of the street, or nearer, perhaps, at the corner of your hallway, or in the room next to where you're sitting now. Watson, the, the mad miners of Cardiff was one of the most spine-tingling adventures you've ever related to us. You must tell us what sort of criminals we're to pursue with you and Mr. Holmes next week, Doctor. Next week, Mr. Harris, I shall relate to you the case of the Burmese goddess. It concerns a strange legend, a man who lost his fingernail and a peculiar auction sale.
the makers of Clipper Craft clothes and more than 1,200 stores from coast to coast, have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Our stories are based upon the character Sherlock Holmes, created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. The program is produced and directed by Basil Lochran. Sherlock Holmes is played by John Stanley. Dr. Watson by George Spelvin. This week's story was written by Howard Merrill with special music by Albert Berman. If you don't know your Clippercraft dealer, write Clippercraft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Here's an important fact you probably don't know. It's possible to save up to 50% of all cancer cases if everyone takes proper and prompt action. Support the American Cancer Society. Send a generous contribution to cancer, care of your local post office tonight. Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in The Case of the Burmese Goddess. This is I, Harris, speaking for Clipper Craft Clothes. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Welcome back. Well, I guess the villain, when he made the offer for the uh, seemingly and apparently worthless mine, that's a dead giveaway. I had not guessed the whole idea that uh, everybody uh, who was pretending to have gone insane hadn't seen anything at all. Uh, That was kind of a unique wrinkle. Well, we turn now to listener comments and feedback, and we have this from Clarissa. Thanks so much for your podcast. I enjoy it every morning at work. I also faithfully listen to your Dragnet podcast and enjoy that as well. Yours are the best old-time radio shows I've been able to find in the podcast uh, format, which I listen to via the Stitcher app. Well, listening to the recent Sherlock Holmes and hearing the Clippercraft commercial for the umpteenth time, I got curious and Googled the address listed for their store in Jamaica, Queens, 164-08 Jamaica Avenue. It's still a men's clothing store. After all this time, I thought it was interesting enough to share. Uh, have a great day and keep the old-time detectives coming. Well, thanks so much, Clarissa. Indeed, I agree. It's definitely uh, interesting enough to share. Uh, one thing I've wondered about is if the John Watermaker men's stores are in existence. Um, I've not actually Googled it because, uh, to be honest, I can't even figure out how to spell that one properly. Finally, we have a review on iTunes. Uh, Kara writes in wonderful podcast of the great old Sherlock Holmes presentations. I'm a huge Columbo fan and found your podcast from your book. Uh, when our telly recently went out, these podcasts were a great replacement, and now, even with a new television, we still listen to the Sherlock Holmes stories, rather than go back to watching uh, television in the evening. Keep up the great presentations. Enjoy the Clippercraft commercials. Well, thanks so much, and uh, appreciate your uh, comments. And uh, it's kind of interesting. I, I always had the idea that the... Uh, uh, podcast would promote the book, but uh, the book also, I guess, can promote the podcast. So we're glad uh, we have people uh, listening and reading. Definitely appreciate it. All right. Well, that will do it for today. We will be back tomorrow with yours truly, Johnny Dollar, and then join us back here on Thursday for another episode of Sherlock Holmes. In the meanwhile, send your comments to Box13 at GreatDetectives.net, follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives, and call us 208-991-4783. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.